to another uh, online kleptoscope from the Frontline Club. Um, we used to do these in the club in London, um, which was great, uh, obviously, when times were normal and everyone could be in the same room as each other. Um, we don't do that anymore. We do that via Zoom, like everything else, which is sad because it means we can't all have a drink in the bar afterwards. But it's also great because it means that we can massively broaden out the scope of the guests we can invite on. It doesn't have to be just people who are in or around London at any particular day, but the most interesting people from all around the world. And so I am super excited about our, our guests today. We have joining us from West Virginia um, at, in a, from a cabin with no running water. We have Sarah Chase, um, I think, um, and widely acknowledged to be one of the world's most interesting writers about corruption with an astonishing CV, which spans being a journalist with NPR, making soap in Kandahar, working with the uh, US military again in Afghanistan, and then writing um, two fantastic books about corruption, of which the latest is Everybody Knows, which I've been reading. And as a result, I've had the Leonard Cohen song stuck in my head for most of the last fortnight. Um, alongside Sarah, we have Daria Kalinyuk joining us from Kiev, um, who is one of the co-founders of the Anti-Corruption Action Center, perhaps the greatest anti-corruption group in the world, um, and one that I'm delighted to have spent lots of time working with and um, talking to over the last six years or so. Um, welcome, Daria. Thank you very much for joining us. And from the UK, someone who might have been able to join a normal kleptoscope because she's actually in the UK is Helena Wood, um, former National Crime Agency and the Treasury um, Charity Commission, and now an associate fellow at RUSI, the think tank, and an advisor to Spotlight on Corruption. Thank you, all three of you, for joining us and joining this Kleptoscope. Um, I didn't write in, in, introduce myself. I'm Oliver Bullo. Um, I do these events. Um, Sarah's going to talk first. Wait a first. second, I think Oliver, what, please. Yeah, well, everyone knows who I am because they do these things. But um, um, Sarah, um, we, I thought we'd talk today about these two twin issues that are imperiling the global fight against corruption. They are COVID-19. Um, like any crisis, it is an opportunity for crooks and thieves to steal yet more money. Um, they always find a way to exploit a crisis and crises don't come bigger than this one, I hope. Um, so that's one problem that the world has. And the other problem is a more parochial one uh, for Sarah, which is the administration in the White House at the moment, which has abandoned the US leadership of the fight against corruption, which has been something we'd all become very accustomed to, at least since the 1970s, that we could at least rely on the Americans to uh, prosecute corrupt players when no one else was doing so. Um, the number of prosecutions under the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act is falling quite fast. Uh, Donald Trump has himself said it's unfair that US corporations aren't allowed to pay bribes because foreign corporations can and so on. This is a new world in which um, we have a, a rampant virus and a US administration that doesn't particularly care. Um, so Sarah, could, you, could we start with you? Could you talk a bit about um, the nature of the administration, how it's intersecting with the virus, and also a bit about this extraordinary book, which goes all the way back to ancient Greece. So this isn't just a, a, a modern book. Uh, yes, and, and I'm delighted, obviously, to be here in your company, and just like you, wish that we could all be around the bar soon. Um, yeah, it's, um, there's an intersection. You said that crises are uh, opportunities for thieves and criminals. Crises are also opportunities for kleptocrats. And so what you see happening, without going into a lot of detail, but it was absolutely predictable that not only some of the obvious things like who gets contracts for you know vaccine research money or um, procurement but who's getting loans for example the um, family of the secretary of transportation who is married to the senate majority leader received a giant i think it's one to five million dollars of loans that were aimed at small businesses, um, and even less well known is the fact that the US Federal Reserve, which is our central bank, has been printing money, basically it's been inventing money that didn't exist before, and using it to buy corporate bonds. 
And many of those bonds, many corporations are deep in debt because they have been, um, instead of investing usefully, they've been buying back their own shares in order to make their share prices go up. And they've been paying their CEOs large um, bonuses and things like that. And they've been speculating in dodgy assets. And so essentially, the United States government has created more than $3 billion and spent it on speculators while, you know, states and cities and um, uh, not to mention individual unemployed people are going without. Um, within President Trump's administration is a remarkable number of people who have been spent their careers in the private equity world. And that includes the Secretary of Commerce, it includes the Secretary of Treasury, it includes several of President Trump's closest friends. And these are establishments that are entirely shrouded in secrecy and are, um, uh, I mean, they're perfect money laundering vehicles, frankly. They're getting a huge chunk of these bond uh, purchases or they're benefiting from them. Um, and then in terms of how that affects the US so-called leadership role on anti-corruption, I mean, when I was trying to practice anti-corruption overseas, that is to say in Afghanistan, when I had a, a practical role trying to do something, what I came to understand is that what really mattered was the leadership provided by the President of the United States. These kleptocratic networks are vertically integrated, means that you can't even arrest a low level official in a truly kleptocratic country without the chief of state getting involved. Once the chief of state is involved, it's not a matter for the commander of ISAF, which I work for, the commander of all the military forces in, in Afghanistan is the country I'm speaking about. Um, it's not even a matter for the ambassador anymore. Once the chief of state is involved, it has to be chief of state to chief of state. And if Washington, at, at that time, Washington was lukewarm, didn't back us up, and the whole thing went to pieces. Then I look at Daria's country, you know, which is the one country where we had, the US had a very serious anti-corruption approach. Um, and I know that because I, after I was in Afghanistan, I then advocated more broadly for anti-corruption policy overseas in the United States. And um, Ukraine, Europe was the only bureau in the US State Department that was serious about it. And the Ukraine embassy was the only embassy that was serious about it. So then you have the whole matter of the Trump impeachment, which, um, was not just Trump being lukewarm about the anti-corruption efforts of the US ambassador in Ukraine, he publicly humiliated the woman in the most devastating way that that can possibly happen to a diplomat who recalled her, not to mention spoke badly about her in public. That is an unmistakable signal to kleptocrats around the world that not only has the US abandoned its leadership role in, in, in trying to counter international corruption, but indeed it is taking a leadership role in being corrupt and it is opposed to any efforts internationally to combat corruption. So that's the first point I'd like to make. I know we, you know, we don't have uh, a lot of time, but I'd just like to say a couple of things. In the United States, Americans are American elites don't like talking about corruption in the context of the United States, because of course we're, set, we're special. We're this leadership country, right, on corruption. Um, in fact, what's been happening since about 1980 is that practices that are considered blatantly corrupt in other countries have been legalized in the United States. And I'm not just talking about campaign contributions, I'm literally talking about the legal definition of bribery which due to a concerted campaign in the Supreme Court has been so narrowed that prosecutors have told me, you, you can only corrupt really bad criminals. And I don't mean bad, I mean bad at being corrupt. <laughs> I don't mean, you know, a bad criminal. They're, they're bored. I have people, I've seen people leaving the, the department because you can't prosecute corruption anymore. 
Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that although I would say that the Trump administration is particularly barefaced in its networked corrupt practices and its bending of the levers of power um, at its disposal, this is not a phenomenon that is limited to the Trump administration. And that was the very distressing thing that I discovered as I was researching uh, Everybody Knows. Um, everywhere I looked, every political party, I mean, these loans that I was talking about that the uh, Secretary of uh, Transportation received, well, there are plenty of top ranking Democrats who improperly received loans like that. Um, there was the, you know, the hedge fund run by a former Trump official, very high you know, profile named Anthony Scaramucci, which was attended by all of the Democratic bright lights. I mean, everyone was at this thing. These networks, one of the things that makes them so resilient and uh, difficult to take down is that they often cross all of the identity divides in the society in which they operate they weld themselves together across those divides, be they, you know, be they political party, be they sect, be they, you know, ethnic group, um, while they assiduously work to divide the population up so that the opposition, you know, is all, it's the divide and conquer uh, uh, routine, basically. Um, and then finally, and that will be abundantly clear as we uh, continue speaking, these networks are transnational. You know, I mean, too often when we look at a corruption scandal, we're looking at a sort of isolated event rather than seeing it as a systemic, as an example of a systemic practice, which is perpetrated by networks that also cross sectoral boundaries, right? They're not private sector or public sector, they're both. And their members circulate between private and public se sector. Very often they include out and out criminals and out and out you know, perpetrators of violence, be they terrorists in a place like Afghanistan or drug dealers or what have you. And they are transnational. There may be hubs in different areas but they're deeply embedded in each other's doings, and I think they learn from each other. And so the historical side of what I said in uh, Everybody Knows, I get into the infatuation with money. I do think there's a cultural undergirding to this type of practice, which is an almost glorification of money that we have started to see in our societies in particular since the, the 1980s, I would say, since about 1980. And I'm not trying to argue that humans haven't always adored lucre, right, obviously. And Jesus is in there, you know. <laughs> um, not only Midas, but Jesus is also in there. And those couple of lines of gospel, the money changers, it's incredibly powerful when you sort of read those lines of gospel in today's context again. Um, but I would say that complex systemic corruption, as we see it today, only existed, the last time it really existed like this was in what's broadly called the Gilded Age. And similarly, that is to say the late 19th and early 20th century. And similarly, it was transnational. It was the same in multiple countries, no matter what their government system was. Um, and it was heavily focused, frankly, on raping the land. It was focused on natural resources. And so, you know, today we find ourselves in the same predicament that we were in, you know, last time we were there is the very early 20th century. And then what happened that got us out of it? Two world wars, a pandemic way worse than COVID, and an economic meltdown. And uh, so, then you got about 40 years of relative integrity in public office. So let's do whatever we can to prevent that outcome. That's a, that's a stirring rallying call. Um, uh, uh, Daria, going over to you. Um, first, if you could tell us a bit about 
the COVID situation in Ukraine and how um, the um, public institutions are dealing with the stresses put on them by COVID. Um, and also um, how life has changed for you, um, ANTAC and the whole anti-corruption community in Ukraine since um, this change in the US administration and the fact that the US is no longer supporting you um, in the way that it was when, when Biden was in the White House and Obama was in the White House. Thank you, Oliver, for two questions. Um, the first one is probably easier. Um, Ukraine during COVID time uh, is, do, is, is, is behaving differently and strangely. Uh, so what I would say that we have internal COVID fund. Uh, however, one third of this COVID fund uh, is spent on building roads. Oh. I have no clue how building roads help to um, help the country to fight COVID. I know how building roads can make uh, some people millionaires uh, through, you know, uh, some uh, schemes and stealings, uh, but I truly can't understand how it helps uh, real people, doctors, teachers who have to be prepared to get students uh, and children schools. Uh, a big stake of COVID fund in Ukraine uh, went to police. Not even to doctors, but to police. And I also can't understand how police is much more important than doctors in fighting COVID. Uh, I see that uh, state institutions, especially, you know, has law enforcement agencies, including the, the head of the, the, the Minister of Internal Affairs, um, needs this money to strengthen himself and to strengthen police and make it kind of uh, a more policing country than he has, has more political leverage. But it's still, it's about politics, it's about plain politics, but not delivering uh, assistance to, to, to citizens and to doctors. Um, we have um, in Ukraine the law which allows uh, to not to do public procurement and regular public procurement procedure uh, for goods uh, which are needed to fight COVID. But when we have analyzed um, all those procurement procedures um, all, all those procedures which were uh, used without this regular procedure, we found out that there were, let's say, some hospitals uh, were um, ordering renovation, fuel, and uh, um, furniture, which is far away from um, what actually is needed to fight COVID. So uh, basically, this is where we are in Ukraine. We are fighting COVID with building roads and increasing salaries for police. Um, in terms of your second question, um, we are very much frustrated now um, uh, uh, un until um, spring last year, 2019, we felt um, a very strong public and vocal support in whatever we were doing in Ukraine from the United States government. And then there started this um, scandal, uh, uh, which was pushed by Rudy Giuliani. Um, he found uh, conspirators in Ukrainian government, specifically the general prosecutor, um, and some other strange for, for, folks like uh, uh, Fruman and Parnas, these are fraudsters caught by FBI in the US. Um, and uh, local uh, Ukrainian um, KGB agents, which uh, are, pretend they are members of parliament, but they are actually KGB agents, and I'm talking about Andriy Derkac. So there's entire plot here in, in, across Ukraine, uh, but also in the United States, with, which is trying uh, and trying successfully to undermine good relationships between Ukraine and the US, and to stop the leverage of the U.S. in Ukraine to promote good governance. And all that scandal happened at the moment when we voted for the new president, for President Zelensky, very unexperienced guy who never been to politics before, except his, um, his movie where, where he played an accidental person who became a president. And then he actually, 
himself became a president. And his first experience of international relations and politics was this scandal where these different strange people like um, Rudy Giuliani and Puma and Parnas um, trying to convince him uh, to do investigation against Biden, trying to convince him to do investigation on Ukraine interfering into American elections. And then there was this very strange and tough call with the president of the United States. So just imagine you're just you're a fresh politician in a country which is in war with Russia, and it's very brutal enemy, uh, which can kill and which kills millions. Um, so, and you have to rely on the partnership with the United States. And I mean, it's military support, it's political support, it's support, it's financial support, it's everything. And the first call is about investigation on the political opponent of the president of the United States. So, of course, I think this is something that uh, was very devastating. And I think that for President Zelensky, it immediately kind of created the feel that you cannot trust the West. Uh, and there are different forces uh, are now in Ukraine, a lot of pro-Russian forces. And we, uh, Sarah, Sarah talk, talked a lot about corruption in the United States, kind of hidden corruption in the United States and legal corruption in the United States. It's very easy to buy a lawyer, a lobbyist, a PR firm who will go against good people. And we have experienced on our example as a non-governmental NGO in Ukraine, you know, composed of 25 people, when all this was uh, organized against us. And not necessarily this is organized simply from inside of the United States. We actually uh, observed how all these uh, tools were organized by the pro-Kremlin forces. And we have to think about corruption as the national security risk and about corruption as the tool for geopolitical games. And we see how Russia is broadly using these tools to bribe politicians, to buy um, lobbyists, uh, to buy loyal, loyalists to what they are doing. And in, in all this impeachment scandal, um, we see that Russia and pro-Kremlin forces in Ukraine, they achieved what they wanted to do. They broke good relationships between Ukraine and the United States. They harmed a lot the support of the United States to Ukraine to, towards building strong institutions in Ukraine and fighting corruption and towards actually being able to protect us from the Russian aggression. And we see that they, they are continuing doing that. For example, now the pro-Russian forces filed a claim to Ukrainian police um, uh, saying that we embezzled billions, literally billions of American taxpayers' money. And this is the same what Rudy Giuliani continues spreading in, in the United States. But Ukrainian corrupt police opened this criminal probe um, and they are continuing investigation, um, which is absolute nonsense investigation. So, and I think that the the the, the ultimate result of, 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 uh, of, of that is also that it is more and more risky for us to do our work in Ukraine. Because our enemies understand that they can, you know, cover up themselves, not only in Ukraine, but also outside of Ukraine, in the country like the United States. They understand that they, understand that they can shut up the ambassador of the United States. So, and... What does that mean for them? Uh, the feel of absolute impunity. The feel that they can go airs in the house of our head of the board, and that's okay. And the, the case which I'm talking about just happened on Thursday um, last week. And in, in, at 3 a.m. in the morning, unknown people simply airs in the house uh, where our leader of our organization lives with his uh, family. So luckily he was not there with his kids and wife, but his parents were inside the house and just accidentally the neighbor noticed the fire and woke them up. So we are, we are thankful to God that everything is, is that, that everyone is safe, but we are 
actually afraid what will be next, if there will be this feel of absolute impunity, if we cannot even rely to our um, usual partners and we treat it and still want to treat the United States as, as the one, as the country, as a leader who can stand behind, stand with uh, us in our uh, way towards building integrity in Ukraine and defending uh, strong institutions which are able to investigate corruption. And the final remark for me, we were able to achieve amazing results with the help of the United States, but also with the help of all international community, all pro-democratic international community. I'm saying, uh, telling also about the UK, about the EU. Um, it, it was the huge, it was the great leverage of the IMF, of the EU, of the US and, 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 and other players. And we worked in synergy with civil society and international partners. And we successfully advocated for the establishment of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, specialized in corruption prosecution, high anti-corruption court. And this is entire new infrastructure in Ukraine, which is able to investigate and prosecute corruption and uh, hold people who rob the country in millions and billions accountable. And we are already having first verdicts of the high anti-corruption court. Untouchable people are now behind the bar, including, you know, uh, and, and there is a, a case against oligarch uh, in, in Ukraine, Igor Kalamoisky, who is, who is now cooperating with Russia to avoid this, that investigation in Ukraine. There is investigation against him also in the United States, but he plays with, with, with Russians in order to avoid that investigation. So I'm, I'm just saying that we are at the situation in Ukraine where there is progress. There are institutions which are already working, but there are huge attempts to roll back all that um, achievements. And without the strong support of, of the West, especially the United States, it's very hard for us, physically hard for us, to protect that achievements. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Daria. Um, Helena, we're gonna to come to you now. Um, I, I did ask you originally to be our hopeful person today, but I'm not sure you felt very happy about that role. Um, <laughs> in, back in, in 2014, when, when um, uh, the uh, President Yanukovych fled Ukraine. Um, there was a big anti-corruption summit here in the UK. The UK played under David Cameron's government um, quite a strong role in, in trying to push back against corruption and uh, bring a bit of transparency to the international financial system. Um, I thought I might ask how we're doing now. Um, you know, how is, is, if the US is going to step back, is there any chance that the UK might you know, try and fill its boots, if only a little bit. Um, how, how are we doing? Shall I start with the slightly depressing prospect first and then move on to the positive? So I, I will try and bring some positivity to the conversation, as I promised. But I think we've seen a gradual ebbing back of UK government commitment to tackling corruption since Cameron. Um, I don't doubt, speaking to his commitment uh, to tackle corruption, I think he showed real global leadership for all his other ills as a leader. Um, however, I think he failed during his tenure to put in the infrastructure that was necessary to drive that forward as a system, systematic part of the UK's approach to its, uh, I guess, global soft power. Um, it was a lot, if, if, if I can use the term for my native Yorkshire, it's, it was all mouth and no trousers. There really wasn't much behind that, unfortunately. So as much as he kept saying, don't bring your dirty cash to Britain, we weren't seeing you know, an investment in law enforcement responses to tackle the huge levels of corrupt wealth that you've written about, Oliver, others um, written about prolifically that sit still in London and the South East and, you know, unfortunately drive up property prices for people trying to struggle by in, in, uh, in the capital. So if we look forward from there, um, I think you saw nothing in the May premiership around corruption. Um, I think what she did do, which could have a, a useful effect for tackling corruption is bring financial crime to the fore as a policy issue within the national security strategy, which I think was a useful tool that still sits there today. And um, what we don't know is whether, you know, our global Britain that we will see in the, I have to mention the B word as well, well as the C word, Brexit, whether this, uh, this, no, sorry, the vision of global Britain, whether that will be a bring your cash here open for Britain, uh, open for business global Britain or one which uh, projects power through a strong rule of law. 
So I can't say I'm necessarily that hopeful that it will be the latter right now. So where that, you know, a policy level at least, I don't see that the current government is anywhere on corruption. Um, however, I promise some positivity, Oliver, and I will bring it. So um, we, are, we are seeing the, the current administration here push heavily for a you know, new role for Britain in the world post-Brexit. We're seeing them push um, British values forward, uh, and those have always been around pro-democracy, around strong rule of law, uh, around strong criminal justice responses, etc. cetera. Um, and what the ask I would put to them, whether they'll take it or not, is you, you don't need to see tackling financial crimes such as corruption, fraud, money laundering as being necessarily anti-business. I'd say it's a really good draw for Britain in the future. If you want needing to attract business into post-Brexit Britain, which will be reasonably decimated by both the B and the C word, uh, then actually if you show a very strong stance both domestically on tackling all the scale of corrupt wealth that's in the UK, um, making sure that we're taking a strong prosecutorial stance, uh, but also a st strong regulatory and supervisory stance against that, that can actually attract business. The strength of rule of law in Britain for me has always been a, a big draw for business. So but I hope the current government will see that it's a real opportunity from tackling financial crime and being that global leader to attract that business that we really will sorely need post Brexit. So you'd say the, the glass is 5% full rather than 95% empty? I'm going to go 25%. You know, I always remain hopeful. Um, you know, that there really there is a real role for Britain to play if it chooses to play it. It's not yet clear where it's going. And um, I think in the kind of run up to going live today, we were talking about corporate transparency. And that's one area where Britain really could take a real glo a global role in pushing forward the corporate transparency agenda. Um, I know Sarah probably sat in the States, looks on enviously at Britain with its, you know, person of significant control register transparent uh, business ownership, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I would say to my colleagues in the States is that good isn't good enough. Um, you know, companies house data, as you rightly pointed out, Oliver, and as I harp on about regularly, it, it's garbage. It's not verified. Um, our company registrar has no power to verify that data. So it's de facto not relied upon by law enforcement or by the compliance officers in the banks as being a true view uh, of what's going on in the UK business world. You know, there's a real opportunity for Britain to reform the way uh, it approaches corporate transparency. It had committed to doing so last July in a consultation document about corporate transparency reform. Sadly, a year on, we're not seeing any progress. In fact, I fear there might maybe some rowing back on those commitments to, you know, bring a really robust response to tackling the kind of poor quality of that data. Um, so I really think if you know Britain wants to have this global Britain role, bastion of fair play, attracting business, then a good place to start would be corporate transparency uh, and really push forward on that. Because if Britain leads on that, it will put significant pres pressure on others to follow, particularly in British overseas territories, which are our Achilles heel to say the least. So yeah, there's a, if they wish to take it, they really could run with that ball and lead it globally and push it at a multilateral level. And that's what it, that's what it needs. Um, so, Sarah, um, we've heard you know, quite remarkably, both from you and, and Daria, about the, the impact of the retreat of the US from its sort of leadership role in the, in the West, what that means, you know, on the ground. Um, I suppose, you know, again, trying to be a little bit hopeful here, um, assuming the election happens in the US in November, um, whether we whether a new president would improve things or whether the fact that, you know, he's from the state of Delaware means, you know, that Biden wouldn't actually really make any difference anyway. Um, what do you think? Do you, I mean, I suppose the, the is, is this a, a, you know, there's, there's a question come in. So by the way, just say to everyone, please send in questions to the Q and A function. You know, Ewan Grant, who's a regular attendee of, of the kleptoscope, it's good to see him here, um, is asking, you know, if the US isn't going to take this role, who, who will fill in? Because, you know, who is the alternative? So, you know, it, it, could the US come back? And if, I mean, I suppose this is the question. Hang on, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself, I think. Yeah. yeah. Wait, wait, wait. There. 
There we are. Um, Biden's interesting. As you say, he's from the state of Delaware. His, you know, he has been, he has backed corrupt business models in his avuncular way throughout his career, including, I must say, in Ukraine. Now, I get it that the investigations that the president was pushing were spurious and, and desperately wrong. However, what everybody knows about his son, that he was put on the board of a corrupt energy company solely because he was the son of the vice president of the United States who was playing a leading role on Ukraine policy is absolutely unacceptable. And, and it pains me to see people across, well, people of Biden's political party who have their fingers pointed very dramatically at Trump trying to excuse that type of behavior on the part of Biden. That being said, um, Biden, from my experience in Afghanistan, he was the one who took corruption seriously on Afghanistan. In fact, almost got into a kind of, I mean, there was a bit of tension with Obama over it. Um, not only that, you do have a much more vocal wing of the Democratic Party in the person of Elizabeth Warren, not as specifically, but similarly in the person of Bernie Sanders. And although these types of issues are less articulated by their supporters than, for example, race issues might be or gender issues and things like that, I mean, there is a pretty good constituency for this, uh, for firming up the U.S. approach on these matters uh, at home and presumably abroad. And so I don't despair, in fact. What I do, what I'm very worried about, and I don't want to get into U.S. politics here, it's not the place, but I would just say that the U.S. election is not going to be pretty. There's a question that's coming for you from Rebecca Cox, actually, asking about um, the UN UNCAC. Um, could that could that be a useful sort of, from what you saw in Afghanistan, do you think the UN could have any role in this kind of battle? Not much, honestly. Um, uh, these matters really are about national um, will and determination. That's my view. I mean, I, I'm glad it exists, the UNCAC. I don't see any, there's no enforcement power. There's no, you know, it's a kind of gentleman's agreement um, and largely gentleman, in fact. I think um, maybe Daria and Helena might have input on that, no? Um, I guess what I would input on UNCAC, I guess it's um, a favorite topic of mine, asset recovery, and I think it's a kind of poor cousin of all the other of money laundering and others. It doesn't get as much prominence. The one thing the UN, has done under its STAR initiative, which has run out of a bit of steam, I must say, but at least it bought um, you no know, alternative powers like non-conviction based asset forfeiture to the fore, which I think is incredibly important in tackling corruption, although we've not seen it utilised as it could be. Uh, but I tend to agree with Sarah, it's uh, an asking, not a tasking, and that's, that's always going to have its limitations. So, Daria, um if the US is not going to be helping in Ukraine, um, who is? Um, you know, is there anyone that you feel is stepping up to help um, you and your colleagues do the work that you do? Well, um, it's hard without the US, but I don't think that US fully left Ukraine, uh, at least. Uh, I, I hope it's temporarily situation uh, when the U.S.-Ukrainian relationships are weak and that U.S. is not that much interested in the good governance in Ukraine. But I'm very much worried that, Sarah told that U.S. elections will be not pretty, but I think that situation in Ukraine will be not pretty, uh, to say at least, until the U.S. elections. I think that... Um, our external enemies and our internal corrupt uh, and criminal network will try to use this as a window of opportunities. And uh, we see how pro-Russian uh, people are surrounding the president of Ukraine 
and are sending are using various dirty techniques including fake information and disinformation to convince him that he has to print money uh, he doesn't need to get loans from IMF and other international partners that the West uh, will, uh, you know, it doesn't care about Ukraine, that Ukraine is in war with Russia and left alone. Um, therefore, you know, our soldiers are dying. So it's in the, in, 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 it's in the responsibility of the Ukrainian leadership to deal with that. Uh, so there will be more and more security incidents inside Ukraine. And we are already witnessing uh, more, let's say, almost every day we hear some news that, I don't know, that the metro, that there is a bomb in metro. Recently, there, were, there was a terrorist in Lutsk. Um, so, and now the, the arson of Vitali house. Uh, I'm afraid that there might be more. And there might be more because of lack of leadership of the strongest partner of Ukraine, the United States. And because there were deliberate strategic uh, activities of entire transborder plot in order to break these relationships and create this window of opportunities. So here is where I'm afraid. And I, I'm seeing now the question to me about, uh, about Ukrainian leadership. Um, yes, there will be more recordings, uh, documents, and even fake uh, and, and even fake, fakely created documents of actually of those fakes um, produced in Ukraine uh, in order to continue pushing this story of, um, of Joe Biden trying up to cover up his son. I fully agree with Sarah. What, what Hunter Biden did is fully unacceptable. Uh, but uh, I'm commenting this story for, for already more than a year, and I'm following the case of Zlochevsky, and Oliver can confirm that since, since 2014. So I know that, Han that Joe Biden was pushing prosecutor general office to investigate cases of Yanukovych associates, including Zlochevsky case. I know that Joe Biden was pushing against corrupt prosecutor general Victor Shokin, who was blocking that investigation and who was harming the investigation of the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom did have investigation over the Lachevsky Burisma case and it freezed $23 million. However, there was no evidence from Ukraine. And it, Victor Shokin was a deputy prosecutor general at that time in charge of, of, in charge of um, investigations. He did not deliver this evidence. He killed that case. And the US Embassy was very, very public about that case and wanted to have justice. And then we were very happy with, with Joe Biden coming and actually um, asking for the resignation of the prosecutor general whom we already asked to resign for, for half a year. Um, so, now, whether Ukrainian leadership can do something to prevent all that fakes? Uh, no, unlikely they will do something. Uh, not because they don't want, but I think they, the amount of challenges which they are facing is much bigger than their capacity to handle these challenges. It is partly because of their it's partly their failure and the failure of President Zelensky. He didn't build a strong team. He simply built the team of his friends and people who are loyal to him, uh, who are not criticizing him. And he trusts not professionalism, but those who are, I don't know, promising um, simple solutions for very complex uh, issues. Um, however, um, Ukrainian president will be very much focused in keeping Ukraine actually going. <laughs> uh, there, is, there, there is a constitutional court now hearing which can dismantle entire financial system in Ukraine. And again, this case is backed up by oligarch Kalamoisky, who is now playing with the Russians. So they, they want to make unconstitutional the law on the deposit guarantee fund. It's like, it, it, what it would mean for Ukraine that, uh, the decisions of closing more than 70 banks in Ukraine, which were money laundering private banks of oligarchs and kleptocrats, 
this, these decisions will be unconstitutional. And it would mean that, you know, we will have to repay the, the, the money to the beneficial owners who are crooks, uh, but the money are not there. And we are at the, at the, at the situation where we might end cooperation with IMF. If, you will, if, if, if the Constitutional Court decides that NABU director is appointed non-constitutionally. And I'm telling that this is Constitutional Court in Ukraine um, because on the paper it is Constitutional Court. But in reality, this is part of the organized crime groups of old elites, old criminal justice and judicial corrupt elites who are trying to stay in power and they are taking bribes from whoever pays to them. So I don't think that it is in capacity of President Zelensky and Ukrainian current leadership to prevent that fix even more. I think that there are some people in parliament who are obviously, you know, like Viktor Medvedchuk, the, the close friend of um, Mr. Putin, uh, who gets money from Russia. I think that they will try to use state institutions to even help. And honestly, I don't think that Ukraine is too strong uh, to rescue the American democracy, uh, honestly. Um, I think it is in the hands of American people. And American people have to understand that corruption um, is, not a, is not only just giving and taking bribes, that corruption uh, is attacking entire democratic way how and, democra and entire democratic ground uh, on which America has been built. So democracy is a target of all these attacks. So in Ukraine, we are very, 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 very modest, small country, which is fighting for its existence. Uh, and we have open Russian aggression. Every, almost every day, some soldiers are dying. Almost every day, some people in Crimea are disappearing. Just a few days ago, a three-year-old boy of a Crimean Tatar a political prisoner disappeared and then found dead. These are the challenges we are facing. And the, the weaker the cooperation between Ukraine and the West is, the more challenges will, will come and the more chances for uh, autocratic, kleptocratic regimes like in Russia, but also in China to take over um, uh, good forces in the world. There's an interesting question, Daria, um, from Mary Dijewski, who is also an old friend of Kleptoscope and who I'm sorry not to be there to see in person. Um, she's asking, and it's an interesting question about whether if the, the obviously the anti-corruption campaign in Ukraine has been closely associated with US support. Um, if, it, if, if that association is removed, might it help, you know, spread support for anti-corruption policies across the political spectrum in a way that, that you might not already have? Is that a possibility? I'm just trying to look on the bright side here. Well, the, the, there was the U.S. support, and there is still some U.S. support uh, in, 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 in fighting corruption in Ukraine. Uh, it's just on the political level, it's, it's much uh, um, weaker. Uh, however, there is a strong support from the IMF, International Monetary Fund, um, and I think now IMF takes the lead. Um, IMF is making... Uh, loans to Ukraine conditional to very specific and precise commitments in the, in the area of good governance. Let's say the most recent memorandum with IMF contained very detailed uh, commitments uh, to reform entire judiciary system in Ukraine, specifically the judiciary self-governance bodies. And what is good about IMF that uh, once you complied with the commitments and you received disbursements, once the state implemented prior actions, this is kind of the top commitments of IMF, then IMF continues monitoring how they are being implemented and whether there are rollbacks. So when there are rollbacks, the IMF monitors that and have a say. So, uh, and this role of IMF was noticed of obviously by the organized crime groups and oligarchs. Uh, and, uh, 
these pro-Kremlin, pro-Russian uh, forces uh, in Ukraine. And they are trying now to, 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 to fight directly to... Like, they, are, they are trying now to do everything possible to destroy cooperation between Ukraine and IMF, to prevent Ukraine from taking uh, new loans. So there, there is a broad disinformation campaign on pro-Russian media owned by Viktor Medvedchuk uh, trying to spread a message among Ukrainian society that loans from the West is a bad thing, that IMF is kind of, you know, is, a, is, is an enemy of Ukraine, that those who are promoting loans from, from IMF are Soros children, like myself, for example. I'm, I'm being called a Soros, Soros children and grant eater. And um, yeah, so to sum it up, we have, a, a strong player fighting for good governance in Ukraine. Um, it's IMF, um, but it's been on, on, the, on the target uh, of uh, organized crime. The EU still has leverage, but I think that EU is very much focused in its internal affairs now, and it is not fully using all the leverage they have. Um, towards advocating for, for, for good governance um, in Ukraine. UK, uh, uh, we, we are of course miss UK in the EU, but we are happy that UK still keeps its interest uh, and strong interest in, in the good governance and, and criminal justice reform in Ukraine. Specifically, the, the, the UK embassy is, is great, is vocal, uh, is active in, 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 in monitoring how the reform is going. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm happy that uh, UK is, is, is still uh, on, on play for, uh, for good governance and strong institutions. Uh, that's good. Um, Helena, um, obviously everything's going to change in the UK now that the Department for International Development is being abolished and who knows what's going to happen next and obviously spending will be cut. Um, but, you know, everyone's been talking about the extent to which the challenges, the corrupt challenges are transnational, inherently transnational. And as Sarah was saying, um, you know, the private and public sector partnership um, of, in the corruption. Um, I suppose one thing, you know, we do need to talk about with regard to Brexit is the extent to which uh, British authorities will continue to work with European authorities. Um, it, you know, we're not doing a very good job at the moment if we can't work with the Europeans will do an even worse job. Is this something um, you, you've you been hearing about, you've been talking about, and you know, what, what's, what's your predictions on this? Um, in, a, in a certain way, you know, it's, it's going to have to be a marriage of convenience, whether the current government or even the British, certain sections of the British public like it or not. Uh, and I particularly talk about that in terms of the in intelligence relationships between the EU uh, and the UK. Um, and you can really see in terms of financial crime and all other crimes, terrorism, you name it, you know, Brit Britain really is the biggest net contributor of intelligence into, you know, the machinery of things like Europol. It's been a really loud voice within Europe on sanctions, for example. So I, I don't necessarily see that they will retract from that. And, and I think they are, they need each other. Uh, nobody, you put the politics aside and you uh, put cops in a room cops will work together, whatever, you know, they, they kind of look alike, talk alike, smell alike from whatever country they come. And I think ultimately what has been sometimes dubbed law enforcement diplomacy at some point will cut through it, particularly in relation to this topic. So I think that's a real positive. Cops don't do politics. I think that's a great thing. And they will do whatever they can to ensure that those intelligence relationships remain. So I think that's great. Um, I think to your point on the merger of, I couldn't call it a merger, the dissolution of DFID uh, and pulling that into the Foreign Commonwealth Office, um, it's hard to say what that'll look like in practice. The only thing I can hope is that it won't wheel back on the really good technical assistance work that DFID has internationally, particularly around counter-corruption, uh, and I'd like to see them doing a lot more on technical assistance around asset repatriation um, as relates to as relates to corruption funds in particular, but across the board, any sort of illicit finance. So um, I think it's a watching brief. It doesn't bode well for a development driven spend uh, rather than a politically driven spend. Um, I'm reasonably pessimistic about that. Um, but I have enough faith in 
British diplomats and, and British development officials, you know, we work with them very closely at RUSI, that they will do what they can to ensure that the good work they've done so far isn't rode back upon. If that's, an, if that's a glimmer of hope, Oliver, I hope. Okay, no, that's good. Uh, glimmers of hope I like, and I'm going to turn to Sarah next because, you know, you always get a glimmer of hope from Sarah um, in, from West Virginia. Um, let's, um, I think it's always, you know, this can seem such a huge um, issue that the sort of the, the, the enemy, the, the corruption enemy um, is so vast, it can seem hopeless. Um, but there was something that Daria once said to me, which is that she doesn't think about beating 100% of it, but just think about beating 1% of it. Um, looking at looking at it from where you sit, Sarah, um, if it was just sort of a message to, to everyone watching, um, what's the 1% that we can beat now, apart from buying your book, obviously, which is available in all good bookshops. Um, you know, what's the one percent? What, what, you know, what should we be focusing on now, and what should people be agitating for? So there are a lot of things for people to do um, at in the end of the book, um, and I really aim them at ordinary people. You know, because as you say, there's a lot. These are networks. I call them hydras in the. Uh, in uh, Everybody Knows, because it seems you cut one head off. I mean, Yanukovych in Ukraine, and then, and then there's still, there are more heads, you know, and everywhere that people have really taken very uh, dramatic action and governments have been overturned, you find that a new head springs up. And so that's one thing to know, is that um, they, it's not just the person at the top. Let's not fool ourselves that it's just the one individual who has come to, you know, personify the network and the system in our countries. That in fact, these are networks and the networks cross all the boundaries that we we're talking about. So the first thing I would say is stay mobilized. Um, and then the second, I think, really important lesson that I learned in doing this research is that it, it sort of takes all of us doing all of the things that we're good at. Um, one of the things I did in, in Everybody Knows is look back if the last time we suffered a situation like this worldwide was in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Well, what were the, the resistance movements like then? I mean, what were people trying to do about it then? And I was really struck by the different often allied, but different in style and even in location movements. And there I did focus on the United States, but you had the, the labor movement. You had some of the more, I want to say, radical political movements that were clearly aimed at, you know, monopolies and the dominance of, of these networks, although they didn't use that terminology. I found one that I didn't even know about, which was called the Farmers Alliance. And I was completely blown away. It was, we're talking 1870, right? In the far Western frontier in the United States, which is, you know, West Texas. I mean, it's only halfway across the country now, but at the time, these are people, I mean, it's the, these are people who live in scattered farmsteads and get around on, the, on horses and covered wagons. No, God knows, no internet. And they were organizing themselves and they had local chapters. They had newspapers all across the country. The newspapers got sent out because of the postal service. They had um, traveling tutors, you know, lecturers who would talk both about farming techniques, but also about really complex things like mo the monetary system and, you know, um, what's called crop lean, which is a way that people had to basically get a loan to have their agricultural inputs on the collateral of their harvest. So they took all the risk onto themselves and the objective was to put them so deep in debt that they could never pay it off at, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Much the same as the system that we're now seeing with industrial chicken farming and things like that. And these people were so sophisticated and the solutions they came up with, which included, you know, a sliding currency standard, which we now have, which included direct election of senators, which we now have, which included a bunch of other ideas, some of which were not adopted, but many of which were. Unfortunately, they weren't adopted until sort of after the big 
catastrophes of the of the you know later decades, meaning the wars and 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 that. But what I'm trying to say here, as I read into their annals and I read their newspapers. You know, they would talk about how beautifully decorated their meetings were. You know, they would have these massive gatherings that lasted for a couple of weeks, you know, among different farmers alliances. And they would, you know, discuss all of their policy options and what, whether they should create a new political party or what they should do about it. And then they would talk about the beautiful bunting and the beautiful garlands that people had woven for these, you know, and the banners that people painted. And, and I thought, you know, there were people who were good at weaving flowers and that's what they were really good at. And they were part of this movement. And you had, you know, steel workers wives who said, yes, our children will go hungry so that we can go on strike you know now they didn't win then and there but i take a lot of solace from that and this isn't quite answering your question specifically but it's precisely to say there isn't just a specific one percent you know there are a lot of dimensions to this problem and that means that we can all select a dimension of it and a way of addressing that dimension that suits our own attributes, our own gifts. And we then need to try. I mean, that means not just, I mean, I do think mass mobilization is necessary. I think mass outrage is necessary, but it's not sufficient, you know, and we have to be careful about mass outrage that's more about expressing oneself than it is achieving a given specific and defined change in the system. I do think that, I mean, in terms of systemic changes that are needed to a great degree in the United States, but in all of our countries, obviously beneficial ownership transparency, obviously um, corporate concentration, um, the ability of corporations to deprive people of constitutional rights, like we don't, Americans don't have a right to take corporations to, to, to court anymore because we sign a contract. When we sign up for internet service, we sign a contract that says that we will submit to arbitration. So we've just given up our constitutional right to trial by jury in, in the case where we would sue a company. And you can't, you can't get out of it because you need internet and all the internet companies do it. So these types of practices are totally abusive and that needs to be dismantled. I also think that what in the United States is called the revolving door, which is to say people who have top corporate jobs and then immediately switch to positions regulating those very same industries and often those very same companies, that has got to stop. Um, and it's called the revolving door, but that implies that it's one individual pushing a revolving door. In fact, that's how the network weaves itself. So I think that's a very important uh, target. And finally, obviously, campaign financing. Uh, so long as political campaigns are a way of providing bribes, um, we're done for. Well, there's enough to be getting on with, I think, there. Um, um, Helena, um, what's our one, let's say in the UK, what's our one thing that we need to be focusing on now? What's our 1% that we need to push on? Oh, God, yeah, that's a difficult question. Um, but I, I, this response to corruption and all financial crime in the UK at the moment, it's less uh, a problem of law. Uh, and more a problem of lack of law enforcement. So, you know, we've got some of the most stringent laws in the books. And I go back to my previous statement about all mouth and no trousers. We've got the best, most stringent asset confiscation laws uh, known globally, possibly even further, going further than the US, uh, the US at the moment with unexplained wealth orders. But there's an inability due to lack of resourcing, lack of skill, to be able to enforce those. So I really, you know, obviously from a law enforcement background, I am going to focus on law enforcement. But I think it really needs to get the, use the really good toolbox that we've got and put it into practice. Um, am I hopeful about that right now? Not, not really, um, unfortunately. So we've seen the failure of a big flagship unexplained wealth order case in the, in the last couple of months by the National Crime Agency. And I do not 
place any blame at their door. Uh, I'd sort of liken them to a kind of David versus Goliath, but without the slingshot right now. I mean, they, they really have been put up against, you know, top elite lawyers and banks of them. Um, and they don't necessarily, with all due respect to the good skill of the officers and lawyers in there, that they can't match that legal might and the money that these people will throw at these cases. So, you know, you have to, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. You really have to start matching um, the kind of money that the private sector will throw at this to attract and retain, importantly, the right calibre of people who will be able to really tackle those big cases that we really need to start seeing go under. Um, so, you know, we've got a spending review coming up in the UK. That's great news. You know, there's not a lot of money in the pot, partly because financial criminals have defrauded billions from the furlough and other business support schemes, sadly. Um, but that's the story for next year that we'll be coming back to discuss, I'm sure. But, you know, what money is in the pot, there should be a priority put towards funding asset confiscation efforts in line with this, you know, this view I put forward as global Britain, arbiter of fair play, then you need to enforce against these the corrupt wealth that sits not too far from where I'm sitting now, unfortunately. So there you go. That's me. That's my 1% of, of the entire budget <laughs> that I'd like. Yes. So Daria, what, what can people do to help uh, your organisation, to help what you're doing and to find out more about the work that you do? Uh, we have our Twitter. Um, uh, I have my Twitter where I post in English. We have a weekly anti-corruption updates newsletter where we highlight uh, key anti-corruption news in Ukraine. Just to and say, your, 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 your Twitter handle is at Antac, A-N-T-A-C-U-A, right? Yes, and my personal Twitter, I also tweet there frequently in English. Uh, so, uh, how to help? Uh, spreading information about what we do, how we do. Uh, we collect also donations. It's possible to to to, don to donate on the Antec website. We are also now collecting fundraising uh, money to rebuild the Erston House of Italy. Uh, it's it's hard now to to wire it from outside of Ukraine, but next week we will we will develop the tool to do that um and simply uh please don't forget about um ukraine and that the corruption in ukraine is not necessarily coming from inside ukraine there was a question which um i think oliver dismissed but about you know that the roots of anti-corruption have to be not outside of ukraine but in ukraine roots of anti-corruption are in ukraine but the corruption is not necessarily rooted from Ukraine. And it's rooted across international financial system. It's rooted from our um, enemy, Russia. Uh, and we cannot fight that only using tools inside Ukraine. We need strong partners and international community to help us and to clean up something that is also on the West. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've been talking for more than an hour, so we're going to stop now. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And thank you very much to Sarah, Helena and Daria for coming and giving up their evening to talk to us. I found that absolutely amazing. And this will be available on YouTube uh, so you can watch it again or send it to your friends. And um, yeah, come next time. Thanks for watching Kleptoscope. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver.